one. That's so you can tell how loud it is. <laughs> it's a profound pleasure this evening to introduce Professor Gordon Christie on this important occasion. This lecture is held in celebration of Gordon's appointment to the rank of full professor, the highest level of scholarly attainment in the university. This is a significant achievement indeed, all the more so when one understands that this rank is awarded following a process that involves consideration by external assessors, consideration by a committee comprised of all other full professors in the law school, and further consideration by a committee of highly respected senior scholars from across the university. Finally, the final step is that the university president has the ultimate decision-making role. Gordon completed his bachelor's degree in philosophy at Princeton University. He completed graduate work at the University of Virginia, did his LLB at the University of Victoria, and in 1997 he finished his PhD, also in philosophy, at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Gordon has held faculty positions at Lakehead University, at Central Michigan University, and in the Osgood Hall Law, Hall Law School at York University, where he was the director of the intensive program in Aboriginal lands, resources, and governments, and where he obtained tenure in 2003. In 2004, Gordon joined this faculty as a tenured associate professor. For much of the past decade, Gordon has served as the director of our program in Indigenous Legal Studies. Our Indigenous Legal Studies program, which creates a supported pathway for Indigenous students to come to law school, is the oldest of its kind in Canada. At present, 20 students each year enter law school through this program, with the result that approximately 12% of our JD students self-identify as Indigenous persons. It is impossible to underestimate the important and long-term commitment that Gordon has made to this program. It was under his leadership that the program was renamed. It was formerly the First Nations Legal Studies Program. Under his leadership that our new specialization in Aboriginal law was created. And with his leadership at a crucial moment in time that our Indigenous Community Legal Clinic was reinvigorated. Gordon has devoted literally thousands of hours to counseling, counseling, supporting, and encouraging students in this program. In addition to this role, Gordon is a sought-after mentor for graduate students. As a frequent instructor in our graduate legal theory seminar, Gordon has provided support to a generation of graduate students, more than half of whom are Indigenous scholars. A number of Gordon's, oh, pardon me, Gordon has, uh, he's also acted as the research supervisor for 18 graduate students at the master's or PhD level, and more, of half, more than half of those students are Indigenous scholars. A number of Gordon's graduate students have gone on to faculty roles in Canadian law schools and to other positions of leadership in the Canadian legal community. As I'm sure you will hear this evening, Gordon is an exemplary thinker. He's intellectually courageous. In the words of one of the external assessors of his application for full professor, Professor Christie is never content with easy claims. His arguments are constructed with care, with textual support, with intellectual curiosity, with honesty and confidence, and with an economical and always elegant writing style. As a colleague, we know Gordon for his integrity. At his core, I think Gordon is a philosopher. He is also committed to changing the world. And these passions he brings together, which others might find to have a pull between them, but they're really reflected in the two major research projects that have been his key focus in the most recent years. One is the forthcoming book entitled Making Sense of Aboriginal Rights, an Exercise in Methodological Naturalism. This is a major book that grapples with the nature of Western law and our dominant understandings of how that nature impairs a robust understanding of Indigenous legal traditions. The second project is his leadership in a pan-UBC initiative 
to work with and for indigenous communities on governance issues and to create a way forward where the engagement begins with listening to communities rather than with setting research priorities inside the ivory tower. Congratulations, Gordon, on the very significant achievement that we're celebrating today. Okay, so I, I have to see whether people in the back are covering their ears or not. Can you hear me? John. <laughs> I, I didn't mean hiding from what I'm saying, but uh, okay. So um, thank you for the introduction. I, I didn't expect that. And it was, uh, it was odd to listen to those remarks. Some of them seem to be a little off base. I, I don't think my writing is economical. <laughs> but uh, yeah, okay. So. Um, I don't know how long this is going to take. I, I have a, a talk, obviously, to give. I haven't timed it. Um, if I start too slowly, I have a sense that halfway through, I'll suddenly realize I'm only 10% of the way through and I'll have to speed up. So I'm going to try and get off at a, at a good clip and, and get through this. I think it may take 30 or 40 minutes. It may take longer. Uh, but there is an end. And I'm going to signal to you where the end is. So hopefully, we'll all be out of here by 6.30. So I'm going to begin by just acknowledging, as um, is appropriate, that we're on the unceded ancestral traditional territory of the Musqueam. And uh, just around the corner, you maybe see a corner of the Capiano house post. And it's always wonderful to be able to stand and see that as you're talking. Uh, it's common in the South for um, First Nations people to introduce themselves by talking a bit about their relations, their family, their clans, their communities. Um, it's not that traditional in the north where I'm from, but I, I think it might be appropriate so to say a little bit. My mother's family is uh, from North Slope of Alaska, from Barrow eastward to close to the Canadian border. In the 1940s, uh, my grandparents with my mom and her siblings, who are my aunts and uncles, they traveled from Barrow eastward. Um, took them a couple of years with one sled and five dogs, and they ended up around Aklavik. And that part of the world, the Western Arctic, Northwest Territories, has been our home base since. Um, so, hello, if this is being taped, to all the Gordons out there, my family is the Gordon family, which is quite extensive across from Barrow East through to Aklavik and Tuck and so on. So I, um, I'm going to uh, start here with a couple of notes. First is that I have a way of using some terms, which is a bit idiosyncratic. Um, I use Aboriginal peoples to refer to peoples as are defined in Canadian law, and I use Indigenous peoples to refer to roughly the same people, but defined by themselves. And so the term Indigenous peoples, when I use it, I'm trying to signal I'm talking about people who are uh, outside the Canadian system and have their own understandings of who they are, where they're from, and so on. Second note is that my talk is going to be almost entirely about Aboriginal rights, which are really a, a subset of the landscape out there. There are treaty rights, and there's all kinds of legislation. There's all kinds of things happening in the world of Canadian law dealing with Aboriginal people or Indigenous peoples. But I'm going to focus right down to Aboriginal rights that are protected under Section 35 of the Constitution Act of 1982. So I'm not going to say much about treaty rights. Um, and I'm not going to say much about these other matters, but I'm going to say something about Indigenous law, which is becoming um, a common topic of discussion today. When I began law school 20-some years ago, <laughs> uh, nobody really was talking about Indigenous law. It's become much more common in the last few years. I'm not going to talk directly about it, but you'll see that it's woven through my discussion here. So my thesis is straightforward, and first thing I'm going to do is give you a little road map. Um, my thesis is simple. I'm going to be arguing that the Supreme Court of Canada has been attempting to complete the project of colonialism over the last 30-some years through its jurisprudence. Uh, and I, I think this probably qualifies as one of those claims that Dean DeVern was talking about. I, uh, not many people would agree with this, perhaps. Some people do. Many don't. What I'm going to do to make this argument is I'm going to go through some Section 35 jurisprudence. I'm going to trying to pull out what I think are the puzzling aspects. There's some enormous puzzles tied into the jurisprudence, particularly from an Indigenous perspective. 
I, I think this is not a particular kind of perspective I'm trying to talk about where you need to get into the minds of indigenous people. You don't need to have the language in order to see these puzzles, but it helps if you just put yourself in the shoes of an indigenous person from a community that's been subject to colonialism for centuries, and then think about the jurisprudence and you'll see these puzzles become heightened. I'm gonna argue in the middle of the talk that um, the puzzles dissolve to a certain extent. If you think about the judges in the Supreme Court of Canada using a liberal frame of mind to think through the problems they face. And if you adopt a liberal sensibility, uh, many of the things that seem puzzling about Section 35 are much less puzzling. There's one last deep puzzle left though, and that's that nothing in Section 35 says anything directly about indigenous self-determination. And in fact, much of the jurisprudence seems pretty clearly meant to remove indigenous self-determination from the landscape. So that's the last puzzle that I'll spend the last third of my talk talking about and trying to say something about. Ooh, I'm a serious person with a glass of water. Hmm. Trying to get a sense of the pace here. So the case law and its puzzles. So we begin in 1990 with Sparrow. Uh, the Musqueam have been incredibly helpful. They're quite litigious. They're responsible for many of the major cases in Canadian law. And so the Sparrow case is a case involving Ronald Sparrow who was fishing down south of uh, Richmond on one of the arms of the Fraser. And apparently he was fishing with a net that was too long. And this went to Supreme Court of Canada. It's the first case that went to Supreme Court after 1982 when the Aboriginal treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada were recognized and affirmed in Section 35. So again, I'm talking particularly about Section 35. I'm talking about Aboriginal rights as they've been recognized in the Constitution. And this case is the first case where the court talked about the problems it faced. It narrowed down to one particular issue in this case. They actually focused on the relationship between Canadian law and an established Aboriginal right. They quickly decided that Mr. Sparrow was in fact exercising the right the Musqueam enjoyed to fish for food and ceremonial purposes. And then they focused on the relationship between that right as it exists and the power of the state. And they decided in that case that um, the Crown from 1982 onward needs to recognize it has fiduciary obligations. It sits in a fiduciary relationship with Aboriginal peoples in certain circumstances, not always. Certain, certain circumstances has fiduciary responsibilities. Now the puzzles about this case, there are many of them, I'm just gonna to point to one. Um, at an important juncture in this decision, the Supreme Court of Canada said that um, the sovereignty of the Crown has never been questioned. And from that point on, they haven't questioned it. That was a starting point. That's at the, that's at the core of the jurisprudence around Section 35. Crown sovereignty was not questioned in Sparrow and it continues not to be questioned. It is at the foundation of the law in Canada on Aboriginal rights. Now the expression never been questioned is, is curious if you look at this from an Indigenous perspective. Just put yourself in the position of an Indigenous person in Canada from a community that's been subject to Canadian law for a century and a half. Yay, 150. <laughs> um, Crown sovereignty has always been questioned by Indigenous peoples and questioned from the very beginning, from the 1600s onwards. There's been a pattern of resistance through the centuries, through the years, through the generations, and it continues to be uh, questioned. So it's, it's, it's true that the court can say that Canadian law has never questioned Crown sovereignty, but Indigenous peoples have always questioned it. In 96, a few years later, the court had its first opportunity to, to look at the nature of Aboriginal rights. And they came up with what's called the Integral Distinctive Culture Test. And it's a fairly straightforward test to describe. It's pretty difficult to use. The notion is that uh, a person, let's use this case as an example. Dorothy Vanderpeet uh, was caught selling some fish, 10 fish, I think it was, five or 10 fish. And they had been caught under a food fishing license, so it was illegal to sell them. Her argument was that the Stolo, she's from the Stolo community, have a, a right to not only catch fish, but to trade them you know, for currency in a modern setting. So the court looked at that claim, and the test they applied was this test. The way it works is you, you need to go back, the Stolo need to go back to the point of contact with Europeans, which for the Stolo would be in late 1700s when the Kenzie floated down the river 
Did he get me this far? Maybe it was Fraser. Sorry. I should, I should have a... I should have McKay in history in my fingertips here, but uh, somebody came down the river in 1793. Uh, probably a Scot. There you go. And um, you need to go back to that point in time and determine what was integral to your culture at that point in time. Now, fishing would, would certainly be integral to the culture of the Stolo at that time, but was trading fish in a way that is analogous to what you see happen today in a, in a, a common marketplace today? Would that be something that would have been integral to their culture at that time. The Stolo failed in that case, so Dorothy Vanderbeek did not succeed. It's very difficult to show that it was an integral part of your culture a century plus ago, that trading in this way that's analogous to something you'd see in a marketplace today was integral to your culture. So what are the puzzles about this? Well, there are many, many, many puzzles about this test. Too many probably to enumerate here. I'm just gonna run down a short list uh, I don't know, might be a line running through the first one there. The first, the first puzzle really is that it's a cultural test. And it, it's odd that that is how Aboriginal rights are determined, is on the basis of culture. Indigenous peoples across Canada all have a strong interest in protecting their cultures. You probably hear this all the time, you know, in the news and in stories about this. But that doesn't mean that culture should form the focus for the test for determining Aboriginal rights. It's odd that the test actually focuses on culture. And what that does, the second question I have about this, is it really uh, creates a disjunction between Aboriginal rights and colonialism. And you would think that Aboriginal rights would respond to colonialism, but that, that would be why they're there, would be to have some way of addressing a history of colonialism. But having the test be about culture really puts Aboriginal rights over here, and colonialism is put in the background. They're very narrow and difficult to use. You probably get a sense of that, the way I was presenting it. You need to go back centuries in time for most people. You know, on the East Coast, you're looking three, 400 years into the past. You need to hire all kinds of experts, spend enormous amounts of money. And, you know, you're trying to be a test, which is strange. You're trying to show that it was an integral part of your culture back at that time to do X. The notion of culture the court uses is uh, straight out of the 1920s. I mean, it's, it's, it's a notion of culture that anthropologists would scoff at, they do laugh at, other social scientists. Incredibly outmoded. The outcomes are very narrow. If an Aboriginal community shows that they have a right, they show they have a right to do a particular thing, a custom, tradition, or practice. That's it. They show they have a right to do this particular thing. Their neighbors who may share their language or history, their culture, they don't have that right. They would have to go to court to show it as well. There's many, many ways in which this is very narrow in terms of outcomes. There's very little link to economic outcomes. It's been very rare for Aboriginal communities or Indigenous communities to show they have rights that have any economic output at all. And there's no room for Indigenous legal and political authority. Now that last point is going to be the focus, obviously, the rest of the talk, right? But the fact is, in 96, the court made it pretty clear they're not really thinking about Indigenous and legal, Indigenous legal and political authority. This little survey is pretty quick. And Gladstone is the last case I'm actually going to spend time talking about. Gladstone came out the same day as Vanderpeet. This is a case uh, where uh, some individuals from the Helsuck community up the coast were themselves, they were selling products of the sea, they were selling herring spawn on kelp, didn't have a license to do so, so they were charged. And the Helsuck actually were successful in showing that at time of contact with Europeans, they were a trading people. And that was a you know part of their their identity was to be traders. And so they were actually successful. This is one of the very few cases where an economic output came out of the case. Although, <laughs> if you talk to somebody from the Health Tech Nation, it turns out that 20 some years later, they're still waiting for this economic output. Um, they haven't actually been able to succeed in using this case, but anyway, theoretically, economic output came out of this case. What I'm curious about in Gladstone, and I actually spend quite a lot of time thinking about this case and talking about it, I think it's a very important case because this is the case where the court decided that certain rights that Aboriginal peoples claim are threatening to non-Aboriginal interests. So at the end of the day, the important part of Gladstone is the second half where the court looks at the place of this right in the Canadian landscape. The court decides that this particular right is, is threatening because if you have a right to trade fish, 
you know, to access you know, products of the sea and then trade it. It's theoretically exclusive in nature, which means that you could theoretically, as a community, push everybody else out of the market. The only limits to the exercise of this right would be um, if the market was saturated or if you caught all the fish or whatever type of fish you're getting. And so the court saw that as quite threatening, and so they adjusted the framework for what the Crown can do if it wants to try and infringe upon this right and opened it up dramatically. It was in 96 when this notion of reconciliation was first becoming um, commonly used. It began to be, appear in the vernacular in the mid-90s. And the court used this concept of reconciliation in a very odd fashion. They said that reconciliation needs to go into this analysis of what the Crown should be able to do to infringe upon the rights of the health sector. And they decided basically that at the end of the day, the Crown should be in the business of balancing interests. And they should be the ones put in the position of deciding how to balance non-Aboriginal fishery interests and health sector fishery interests. So there are a number of puzzles about this. Um, one, you know, again, many, many puzzles. I narrowed it down to just a couple. The Crown here is assumed to be the legal and political authority vested with the task of determining resource allocation. What I mean by that is just what I say. <laughs> you know, the way the court deals with this case it is, is puzzling to Indigenous people because they don't even consider the possibility that the health suck and the Crown might have to get into some negotiations around how they're going to manage this resource. At the end of the day, the outcome of this case is that the Crown is obviously the authority in the right position to decide how to balance interests. And the health sick interests are just going to be balanced against other interests along the coast. So the second question is the flip side of that. Where do we see the health sick in this? You know, they have a right to do a certain thing. They have a right to physically do something. But the fact that they've been living in this area for thousands of years and have been managing the fishery resources for all that time is just out of the picture. Trying to catch up to myself. Okay. Now there are, um, of course, other cases to look at, and I'll just say a word about Haida Nation. Uh, Haida Nation came out in 2004, and that is largely the result of this case, Gladstone, because it's pretty clear that after Gladstone, the Crown decided that really the court had signaled to it that it could just go ahead and do what it had been doing for the last 100 years. The costs to it were very minimal. They could just go ahead and, and continue with the status quo. And it might have to compensate some First Nations a little bit around the edges of this and that. But you just have to add a line to a budget somewhere, you know. Potential cost, having to compensate First Nation for infringing upon their right. And that's what they did, right? The Crown, like the provincial Crown. BC just decided, well, this is a signal to us that we can just keep doing what we're doing. Hyde is a response to that. Hyde Nation in 2004 came from the court getting frustrated with the fact that when they were sending signals to the crown that the crown had to start thinking of its legal obligations it always just went around those in some fashion or other and in that decision in 2004 um, the court fleshed out this notion that there might be duties to consult and accommodate you're all very familiar with that i'm sure you can't avoid reading a newspaper nowadays without seeing some story that deals with duties to consult and accommodate i'm not going to look at uh, haida because it's really it, it's not very helpful it's, it's not very helpful for a lot of reasons. It's, it's procedural in nature. And it begins with the assumption that the Crown is about to do something. So the starting point for the application of Haida Nation is the Crown is about to decide to do something, like, say, approve some pipelines. And you know, once that decision is on the horizon, once the Crown is already beginning to make its decision, then it might have to start talking to Indigenous peoples involved or affected. But it's all procedural. Very empty, empty decision. Empty, except that, of course, graduates from this building have made livings for the last 10, 15 years off of that decision because it's become an incredible industry for lawyers to go and argue about duties to consult and accommodate. What about Chakotan Nation? Aren't I going to talk about Chakotan Nation? Uh, I might get to that later. <laughs> I want to just stop for a second here uh, and just say a little bit about where I'm not going with this. Section 35 is, um, it, it has benefits to it. And my talk today is not about looking through the case law and complaining about things that 
didn't go the right way, and then looking for the parts of the jurisprudence where things seem to go in the right direction, and then trying to argue, well, we should tweak things a little bit here and tweak things a little bit there. You can do that, and I think there's benefit to doing that. Communities on the ground have been able to use Section 35, uh, and the landscape is quite different from what it was in, say, the 1950s when there was really nothing available. I mean, people get to make arguments. They get to, they get to feel like they're doing something, at least, and then sometimes they get to use Section 35 as a threat because what Section 35 can do is it can slow things down, and that gives communities an opportunity to negotiate impact benefit agreements and these other financial arrangements. So there are some benefits. My pause here is just to say I'm not getting into that kind of talk where I'm looking at the good and the bad and trying to pick up the good stuff and promote it. What am I, what am I doing? Well, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try and resolve some of these puzzles around the case law. I want to suggest that there are ways in which we can understand what the court's been doing. Because I, I scratched my head for years when I was a law student, when these cases came out, kind of dates me. You know? uh, I was in law school, was I in law school? Yes, I was in law school when Vanderpeet and Gladstone, Gladstone came out. And I just finished when Delgamo came out. And these cases were just completely bewildering to me. I couldn't see why the court would say what they said. It didn't make any sense. But now, years later, I, I think I can see what they were thinking as they put these things together. And uh, this, the way to do this is to just put yourself in the mind of a person who's lived their lives within the environment of liberalism, which is the judges. Right? The judges are all brought up. They're all graduates of law schools. They practice. They became judges. Their lives have been immersed in liberal thought. I'm going to start with an absurdly simplistic sketch of liberal thought, just in case you know, we need to refresh ourselves a little bit. And here I decided to go to the dean of liberal thought. So why not go to one of the big guns? Uh, John Rawls, whose theory of justice from 1971 was incredibly influential, is the person I go to. I actually go to his restatement because he's much clearer in the restatement <laughs> 30-some years later. I just want to pull out a couple of little threads just to give us a sense of what is going on in the world of liberal thought. In 2001, in his restatement, he says that in the theory of justice, he was really beginning with a couple of basic ideas that were going to, that were going to then inform the rest of the process and lead to this principle, these sets of principles that would come out of the theory of justice. He begins with these three basic ideas. The idea of society is a fair system of social cooperation over time. The idea of citizens is free and equal persons. And the idea of a well-ordered society. These are intuitions, he says, that develop over time by people living within liberal democratic societies. Now, this is 2001. He didn't actually say these kinds of things in 1971. Uh, he had evolved as a scholar. By 2001, he's ready to acknowledge that really what's going on is he's thinking of life in a liberal democratic society, and then he's thinking about the ways people think in those societies. And people think with these basic thoughts in mind when they're considering what it is to exist within a liberal democratic society. I'm going to focus on the first two. The third you can forget about. And actually, I'm focused on the middle one, obviously, the idea of citizens as free and equal persons. The first one, though, helps a bit to, to, get a, to get a sense of what's going on with the second point. The idea of a society as a fair system of social cooperation over time. Wallace thinks that there's one general problem that political philosophy faces in the second half of the 20th century, and that is to you know, think about what an ideal model for a liberal democratic society would look like trying to arrive at an ideal model. Well, the way to get there is to begin from the starting points, which are these ideas that we have, these intuitions we have about what life is like in a liberal society. Now, this first one is, is interesting, because what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to imagine society is, in its ideal state, a fair system of social cooperation over time. We'll step back from that a little bit, and you'll see that behind that notion is the idea that we're all individuals with our own interests, our own concerns, our own life plans. We're, we're together in a society. We need to cooperate over time. 
And what we need is a fair system of cooperation over time. We need to work this out as individuals. So embedded in this idea is much of what you see in the second point here, this notion that we are essentially conceiving of ourselves as citizens, as free and equal persons. He describes this as a political conception. He says it's not a metaphysical conception. He's not saying that people are actually free and equal in some metaphysical sense. He's saying this is how we think of ourselves. In a liberal society, this is how people think of themselves and of others, as being free and equal persons. So it's a conception. And what's involved in the conception? Well, the conception has us thinking that we have the moral power to have a conception of the good, where individuals aren't thought to have to view themselves inevitably tied to the pursuit of a particular conception of the good, which they affirm at any given time. So at the core of this notion of a free and equal person is this idea that we have our own conceptions of the good, and we're not tied to those. The last part of this, we're seen as capable of revising and changing this conception on reasonable, rational grounds, and they may do so if they, they, may do so if they so desire. So at the base of a political philosophy that's going to develop an ideal model of liberal democracy is the idea that we think of ourselves as having our own conceptions of the good, each of us, and we also have the power to revise those conceptions and to change our understandings of what it is we pursue and what we value. The liberal project, then, is actually to build social institutions with that conception of the person in mind. So that's what the liberal project is. We're supposed to imagine that we're in a liberal democratic society, but we're engaged in this project of reforming our institutions to better meet this ideal model. What would an ideal model look like? Now, we don't need to follow Rawls any further, luckily. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, we would be here until 10 or 11 or something like that. We can cut them off at this point. Um, the thing to keep in mind is, is what's the project? The project is to think about how we're going to build our social institutions, and that includes the law. How we're going to build the legal system so that this conception of the person is at the ground floor of the architectural planning going on. What that's going to mean is that social institutions are going to be things that we decide to build in order that humans as individuals can flourish. So that individual humans can pursue their particular goals and they have the room within these institutions to change their minds and to come up with different plans for the future and different uh, values and so on. Now that should be somewhat familiar because I don't know if everybody in this room, but the vast majority of you probably were born and raised in liberal democracies, so this should all be like, oh yeah, that's, that's... Interestingly, the flip side of this, right, that's, that's the core uh, notion of what's behind the liberal project I want to get across, but tied into this are some things on the flip side of this. There's a mistrust of tradition and of forms of non-democratic authority. And those of you in the room who have studied um, the emergence of liberal thought in the early Enlightenment and then its development through the 1800s when it became one of the dominant voices in the West, you know that one of the big driving forces here was this move to break out of the constraints of tradition and to deal with these casts of power that had been developed that controlled the lives of almost everybody. Almost everybody in Europe through the 15, 16, 1700s, they were incredibly constrained by tradition and by different regimes of power. And liberalism was one way of breaking out of that. And so a result of this is continuing mistrust of tradition and it forms a non-democratic authority. There's some accommodation for local authority, but it's, it's carefully crafted. So for example, there's nothing wrong within a liberal democracy of a bunch of people who work in a particular location deciding to unionize. And if they decide to associate into a union, then they can develop some local form of authority. They can make decisions within this group, and they can negotiate with their company and all these things. That's OK. But there are a couple of key features there. First of all, those people themselves are initially conceived of as being individuals. They decide to act. They decide to form an association. And you know, that power that they wield is going to itself have to fit within the larger liberal democratic umbrella. Third thing is that 
you know, liberal theorists all agree that whatever kinds of forms of association are allowed to exist within a liberal democratic state, individual people have to have means of escape. So if you find yourself um, having been born and raised in a particular religious setting, for that setting to persist within a liberal democratic society, there's going to have to always be a means of escape for people in that kind of situation. Because you might have been born and raised in a particular setting. There has to be a way in which you can change your mind and decide you don't actually agree with the tenets of that, tr that religion and you can leave. Okay, now going back to, uh, going back to the case law. Now I think it's possible to, to not be so confused by some of these things. You know, and being confused, I think, was, for me, much uh, to do with the fact that I had a sense of myself as an indigenous person, and the case law seemed very puzzling. Now, thinking about these rights that are developed by the courts, why do they have the odd nature they have? Well, they have to have a minimal, they have to be, uh, I'll just read this off, they have to be tools of minimal required toleration. When the court was faced with the um, task of deciding what Aboriginal rights looked like, it was aware of the fact that you know, Aboriginal people were trying to argue they had rights to do certain things like fish or trade fish and so on. Those things can be tolerated as activities within society only to the degree that they show that they were chosen. They were chosen activities. Individuals decided to do those things. So the Stolo could be looked at as a community of people as a group of people, they identify strongly with fishing. In a liberal democratic society, we can recognize that group has a real strong interest in fishing to the extent to which we think that they chose that activity. Choice is essentially important in a liberal democratic society. Now, on the flip side of this, of course, these are argued to be traditional ways. The reason the Stolo are identified within themselves as fisher people is because they see themselves as traditionally fishing. Fishing is something that they're all born and raised within. And liberal democratic societies are suspicious of traditions. So the thinking of the court is we will minimally recognize this activity. We will tolerate its presence in our society. But we will try to move Aboriginal people away from that because you know, they, they mistakenly lived that way before they saw the light of day when we introduced liberal, liberalism to them. But now, you know, they're embedded in a civilized world. They understand that liberalism is the proper way in which to organize societies. And so they need to be tempted away from their unfortunate ways. They need to be placed into the mix. They need to, be, they need to come to think of themselves as persons, the way that we saw roles of the person. I think this works to resolve many of the puzzles. You know, I leave it to you as an exercise, since it's already gone, <laughs> taken 35 minutes. You can go back now and, and, and think through Sparrow, Vanderpeek, Gladstone, and uh, I've already sort of sketched out how this notion of liberalism makes sense of many of the puzzles. But there are certain puzzles that, if anything, are heightened once you think this way, once you think through what the court is doing, there are certain puzzles that just remain. And the central one is, what happened to indigenous legal and political authority? If you read the decisions, if you go through the decisions and look for places where the court might have thought about the fact that the people involved have their own legal and political authority, first of all, you find very, very little reference to this idea. But you occasionally see hints that the court is aware of these arguments, they're aware of this fact. What the court typically does in response is just to presuppose that indigenous peoples are already Aboriginal peoples. See that, for example, in Gladstone. At the heart of Gladstone, there's this assumption that the Crown has the authority to decide how to allocate resources between fishers up and down the coast and the reason that's appropriate is because the Crown is the sovereign authority over the Heltsuk, who are just part of Canada. 
Right? That's, that's the presumption the court makes, that the health sector part of Canada. Now, you know, this is a presumption the court makes, but as I note, there's, there's a set of facts out there that run into that. You know, there's a certain kind of history you could tell where that would be the outcome. But there's another history, the history told by Indigenous communities of resistance and of their continued existence as separate, independent sources of legal and political authority on the landscape, right up to 2017. So we have Indigenous people saying, wait a minute, you can't presuppose we're part of Canada. But the courts tend to begin with that presupposition. So that's the remaining puzzle. And try and keep this going here, okay? Uh, about two thirds of the way through, but you're probably saying, where's dinner? Yeah. I complicate things in that point, <laughs> which isn't a good sign. Right? It's an interesting complication, though. The complication is that when you pull back from this a little bit, you'll see that the crown and its, and its courts, I put the courts as an arm of the state, because they are. Right? The crown and its courts face a very difficult situation. World War II was an interesting turning point in policy. It's at the end of the Second World War in the 1940s, end of the 40s, into the 50s. You see the crown begin to rethink what it had been doing up to that point in time. It had been involved in very overt forms of colonialism up through the Second World War. And after the war, you begin to see voices within the Canadian state saying that we can't keep doing this. We need to actually start living according to our principles. So the 60s and 70s, you see fits and starts. Uh, Trudeau, the older Trudeau, was a classic liberal philosopher and he was thinking about how to respond. His first response was incredibly horrible, but he rethought things, and you can see them, people thinking about this. Now, there, there are two problems the state faces. They decide that they need to start living according to their principles. Well, the principles that they live through and by are the principles of liberalism. Those make it very difficult for the state to actually respond to the problems that they created. Not impossible, but very difficult. Adding to that is this other problem, which I find fascinating, which is that you can't look at the picture just from that narrow focus, because really the Canadian state itself faces other indigenous communities that have their own theories of legitimacy. So if you were to you know, write a book about the state and colonialism in Canada, you might be tempted just to work through it all in terms of what legitimacy is understood to mean by political philosophers in Canada, you probably then have a very narrow focus. Because there's other theories of legitimacy that emerge from indigenous communities. Now the Canadian state then is faced with two problems. Its own foundations are suspect from within its own theory of legitimacy. The fact of the matter is the state in Canada did not do what it should have done to form itself in a proper fashion. But that's the big problem that Canada faces. But they also face this other problem. <laughs> they can't just re they can't just reform themselves from within their own notions of legitimacy because those don't apply to indigenous peoples. Now a solution to all this is what you see in the courts. The Supreme Court of Canada has its quick and easy solution, which is to make this presupposition, just wash over things. Just, let's just say the indigenous peoples are already aboriginal. Let's move on. Of course, that, that begs the question, right? So. Now, I, I'm going to skip over this, uh, this last part of this slide here because that got me off to another little discussion which we can skip over right now. Um, the question is, you know, does the, does the court need to keep pressing ahead with its agenda? It keeps trying, my argument is, to complete the colonial project. Does it really have to do that? Um, and I was going to go into an argument about how I think it feels it has to because it really is not so much about liberalism, it's about the modern resource extraction world we live in in Canada and the capitalist enterprise. Okay, that, that's for some other discussion. But looking at this within the liberal world again, if you again go back to the position of thinking of yourself as a judge, Supreme Court of Canada, looking at the world through the framework or the lens of liberal thought, then you do have to press on. You have to address this problem at the foundations of the state, a very complex problem. 
Now their solution, of course, is again a bit odd. They, uh, they just want to presuppose indigenous peoples are part of Canada. To solve these problems, um, they can't obviously go back to the original techniques that were employed by Canada. Canada's original set of policies were to, A, hope that indigenous peoples all died away. That was the first plan. Um, there was hope, you know, the Canadian state actually hoped in the late 1800s that that was going to be what happened. It didn't happen. So you also had running along this, these other policies. Take the kids away from the families, put them in schools where they don't learn the languages, they don't learn their traditions, they don't learn their ways of life. That was a way in which the state was going to remove indigenous self-determination. Because at the heart of that, what it did was it broke the transmission of authority from family to family, from community to community through time. But they can't go back to doing that, although I would say that they are still engaged in that, but um, put that to the side. They're more interested in trying to do this in a way that accords with the principles lying below the foundation of the state. So avoiding, just leaving to one side this idea you can just sort of presuppose indigenous peoples are already part of Canada, because that's a non-starter, right? What else can they do? Well, now I bring in, this is my signal we're at the end of this, so this is the last little discussion here. I bring into the discussion um, some work being done the last couple of decades by John Searle. He argues that uh, it's possible to understand all of the aspects of the social world is being built by humans, which I think is perfectly plausible. And he spent a lot of time showing how certain social linguistic instruments that we use build things up in the social world. We create social reality as his thesis. Right? The name of his second book here is Making the Social World. We create the social world. The two things that are most important for him are declarative statements and social functions. Declarative statements are things like, I promise I will be done in 10 minutes. That's me. And in saying that, I make it so. Right? I, I, I create a part of the social world we live in. You now have a promise made to you. You have expectations that are reasonable. I have obligations. All that was created just by me saying a couple of words. Right? And Searle points out that you know, behind all that, there are other things that had to have been created through social linguistic instruments. There had to be the institution of promising created. That took more time. My statement, I promise I'll be done in 10 minutes, doesn't make any sense unless this large institution exists. But we built that too. We created the institution of promising. Social functions, I'm, I'm not going to get into more details here. I was going to spend five or 10 minutes describing how he models the way in which we create the social world. The important part here is just that um, I think this accounts for many of the ways in which we create forms of social reality. I'm not, a, I'm not actually a disciple of Searle because I think he is uh, radically incomplete in his account. <laughs> Very interesting, and I make quite a lot of use of it. But he begins with the idea that he wants to explain how a given social reality is coming to being. So he starts with his existence in a liberal democracy in Berkeley, writing about life in the States. Very much like, uh, like Rawls. The thing I'm looking at, though, isn't discussed by him. He doesn't look at the situation we're faced with. What we're looking at is one social world meeting other social worlds. The social world of the state and the Canadian society and its authorities meeting dozens of other societies, which are themselves, each of them, their own social worlds that have been constructed over time. Now, Cyril has... Um, something to say about how a new form of social reality comes into being. So let's say that um, the criminal law begins to uh, criminalize forms of behavior that weren't criminalized before. How does this come up to the point where it becomes part of our reality? How does it become part of the social world we live in? And he talks, he originally talked about acceptance. He thought collective acceptance was something that was necessary. That was too strong. We don't need everybody to accept something in order for it to become part of our social reality. So the later book, the 2010 book, he pulls back from that and says, what has to happen is we have to collectively recognize that this thing is now part of the world around us. 
So we would need to collectively recognize that now it's um, illegal to do X, Y, and Z, or legal to do X, Y, and Z. That's helpful for the thing I'm looking at, which is one society bumping into another. Now, you know, what it does is it bumps into dozens of others, but we can just think of it as two societies meeting. How do forms of social reality become forms of social reality when collectives meet? When one collective meets another, how does the one get the other to become part of it? That's what Canada wants. Canada wants indigenous peoples to become Aboriginal people. Now, there are two ways, several notes, in which that could happen. I'm, I'm extrapolating here because he doesn't talk about this particular kind of situation. He's, again, talking about how a new form of social reality comes into being within the society. But you can extrapolate. The first is, he says, there can be force applied. You can destroy other ways of thinking and replace them with the ways of thinking you want to be in place. And that is the history of colonialism in Canada up to the 1960s and 70s. Right? Now, though, post-World War II, Canada is trying not to do that. Uh, I shouldn't even say that. I don't think they're trying. They're, they're trying to avoid the appearance of doing that. <laughs> so what they're doing is they're looking at these softer techniques. You want to have the collective that you're trying to unfold within yourself think there are no viable options but to think this way. Try and get them to think there are no viable options other than to think this way. So in the context of Aboriginal rights, you want to get Indigenous peoples to think you don't really have any other viable options but to go this route. Accept that you have rights. Become collections of persons. All these kinds of things. And the other option is to somehow work it so they don't even think there are other options. I think both of these are what the court is trying to achieve through its development of Aboriginal rights. It's trying to get Indigenous people to think there's only Aboriginal rights out there. Now, most Aboriginal communities or Indigenous communities I'm aware of uh, working with know this is a game being played. But some are, are getting into this mindset marked by the second option here. Some people are beginning to think that really this is nothing in the, except this one game to play. Go for title, go for rights, and so on. So what we see the Supreme Court of Canada doing in the last 30 years is, is two projects. So the first is within the liberal world. Right? They are building up this set of uh, rules and principles and tests within the jurisprudence to push and pull indigenous peoples into the world of being Aboriginal peoples with Aboriginal rights, thinking through the world in terms of liberal democratic forms of thought. All that is woven through this other set of uh, projects they're engaged in. And that's deploying these softer techniques to either get indigenous peoples to think there are no other viable options or to have them not be able to conceive of other options. All of that, my argument is, this is my claim, all of that is an attempt to complete the colonial project. It's to remove indigenous peoples and replace them person by person with Aboriginal people. And there we go. Thank you. Whew. Thank you so much, Gordon. Um, so you have uh, graciously agreed to take a few questions. And uh, we know that you have a preference for the difficult questions. So um, I will bring a microphone to whoever would like to pose such a question. While you walk around with a microphone, I will, I will note that I came prepared with my own question. Um. <laughs> this would be a question for you. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, actually it is. I'm going to put it back as a question for you, because I mentioned two-thirds of the way through that I come back to Chakotan Nation, and I didn't, and that was deliberately done. So here's a little bit of homework. If you know anything about what was said in Chakotan Nation, can you think that what was done there fits within this pattern? I can answer the question if you can, but that case makes a lot of sense. It's a very, very puzzling case, and you get into the details, but a lot of the puzzles dissolve if you think the court was thinking through this problem from the position of a liberal world. Well, now I'm going to give the microphone to Margot, who may answer that question or pose one of her own. You know what? I feel like I've been sucker punched here, Gordon, because I, I put my hand up to ask you a question, not to answer your question. So I'm going to persist. Um, but I wanted to ask you about your use of Rawls. So Rawls isn't the only liberal to whom you could turn. He's not an unobvious choice, but he's a particular choice. And Rawls also has a notion of the social, which some other variants of liberalism don't, or at least don't as well. Can you talk a bit about why the only liberal you gave us was Rawls? 
time. It's all just time. No, actually, there's a backstory to that. Um, it's funny when I was introduced as having an economical style of writing because my, my text at this point is over 400 pages long. So you can imagine that in that I talk about a number of other people. Um, Rawls came into the picture late because I actually had somebody say, well, you don't actually cover a wide range of liberal thinkers. Now, I argued in my text that I don't have to because I'm not trying to present a theory of liberalism. I'm just trying to say this is how the judges likely think. And the judges themselves are not philosophers, they're not academics, but they've, they've come to think of the world a certain way. I'm trying to get that picture in the minds of the readers. I'm not trying to say that uh, you know, any of the judges in the Supreme Court are actually in their spare time going through roles and trying to make sense of it and so on. So there's that part of it. Now Rawls is helpful because he's actually quite clear in these parts where he talks about what it is he thinks we conceive of as the person, which is helpful for me because I think the court is really thinking that way. They want indigenous people to think of themselves as persons in that way. And Rawls himself calls it a normative conception of the person, which is very helpful because that's what it is. It's a norm. So that's why I bring in Rawls. The, the person I relied on most heavily up to uh, you know, a year or so ago was Kimlicka because he's Canadian, right? Uh, and he has spent 20 years looking at the problems for liberalism when it manifests in a multicultural society. He's got lots of books on this topic, articles, uh, but I spent too much time on, on Kimlicka, so I was looking around for some other people who just say something very pithy, very useful about how in a liberal society we think of the person. I'm happy to have a suggestion that there's somebody else that I can read in the next day or two. <laughs> you know, I, I think I've gone through um, a wide range of liberal thinkers. Um, it just, I, I agree with uh, Duncan Bell, who has an article came out a, a year or so ago where he says, you know, there's no, there's no real censor, there's no real pattern to liberal thought. <laughs> so it's very hard when you actually want to bring different people in because they don't agree with each other. Thanks for your talk. I really uh, enjoyed that. And um, I especially liked your provocative proposition about the Supreme Court. It got me uh, thinking, and um, I think you're on to something. It's not provocative. It's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> no one said the truth couldn't be provocative. Um, so where I wanted to follow up, though, is I'm, I'm very puzzled with uh, where, where we're left at the end, though. So I want to get your uh, further thoughts on this, because I know you have them. Your critique is that the project the Canadian state is involved with and the Supreme Court is part of is, as I understand it, collectivizing indigenous people such that they become defined as aboriginal people, so then they fit within these essentially constitutional categories and then are dealt with according to the, um, the Canadian constitutional project. And it's, it seemed like you were calling for a, a different approach. And I just want to, I'm, I'm curious about this collectivization concern you have because liberalism is about the individual and it sounds like you actually would prefer that approach and that it's this collectivization that is uh, at the core of your concern. So I just wanted to understand if that, if I get you correctly and if there is some part of liberalism that you maybe do like. Okay, uh, there's a couple questions there then actually. The last one is interesting because I, I, I've, uh, I've been born and raised and lived my life in a liberal democracy and I don't actually have you know, serious objections to the life I've led it, uh, it allowed me to go places I wouldn't have expected. The first part, though, um, so, sorry to say my answer to the first part is, is no, I don't really put much emphasis on that part of the picture. I'm not actually saying anything about the collectivization of Aboriginal peoples into Aboriginal peoples. Um, that's not really, well, what I'm more concerned about is not that part, but that as an Aboriginal community with Aboriginal rights, once you have rights, even though they're defined communally, they are treated as just a, a set of rights held by a group of people, by a group of individuals. You lose all that, that backstory about these people being people in a political sense. Right? That's what's missing. So that, that, that problem that, that you end up with three categories, and that, that's, that's interesting, but I'm not really, um, I'm not saying much about that, because I'm more concerned about the way in which, again, there's a notion of the person, this normative conception of the person that is being pushed through the Aboriginal rights jurisprudence in a kind of a hidden fashion. At the end of the day, if you have an Aboriginal right, you're in a world in which you're expected to think of yourself and the state will think of you 
as being a person who just happens to be associated with other persons who happen to be stolo, and then as a group you have this right. And that's, that's the end of your political existence. That's what I mean by the completion of the of colonial project. You're getting rid of these other political entities that way. Is there an alternative? I mean, there's a middle question there too. <laughs> yeah, lots of questions, Brent. I, I do have an alternative, but I didn't. Okay. Um, Christy, I think you get the last question. Sorry, I don't know. I might even actually be moving into our dinner time, so sorry. Um, thank you, Gordon. I really enjoyed this. I thought it was um, very compelling, and I appreciated your argument about, about liberalism as being the explanation underlying these cases. Compelling because it's the truth. <laughs> there you go. Not only is it uh, provocative, it's also compelling and still the truth. Yep. Um, so uh, when you were talking about uh, Searle at the end and the idea of... Um, of what I would understand as sort of cognitive capture, what came to mind for me was the, the um, scholars of power, right? So people like Stephen Lukes or Pierre Bourdieu. And I was wondering, first of all, if you had thought about the sort of Bourdieu habitus idea, the idea that you have to develop, uh, you know, he, he, he's critical of it, but he says that you sort of, that, that um, you end up developing this, this feel for the game in order to actually play the game. And in the process, you find yourself being co-opted. And so I wanted to know if, how that related to the Searle perspective or to your perspective. And then I guess my second point would be, um, you know, I think, what, I think your work has done some really valuable ground clearing and explaining these connections. But, um, you know, I, I would also love to hear where, where to from here, right? So, so if... So if it's not the case that, uh, you know, if, if we want to problematize that, that sort of cognitive capture, then, then as a sort of an agenda moving forward, where do you go from here? Does that make sense? Yeah. I guess I can respond to the first question in two ways. One is that the notion of cognitive capture and all that other stuff is, is something I, I'm concerned about, but I'm not concerned about it in the same way. Um, it's not a global concern for me. I think it's a matter of knowing what's happening, like the value I, I hope comes from my work for indigenous people. It's just they're seeing more clearly what the game is. And that particular part of the game, you want to know what the game is and what the rules are and how to respond. But you don't need to think of the world that way. You, know, you just need to realize that's what's going on in this context. When, when the Crown and its courts are interacting with you, this is what they're trying to achieve. They're trying to get you to think a certain way. And you can just localize it to that phenomenon. Uh, second response to that is that I'm also very cautious about getting into the whole uh, discussion of social construction because that has a long history too and Lucas and others involved in that. It goes back to the 1960s really. There's a book called The Social Construction of Reality going I think from the 60s. So, so it's a concept that's been around for a long time or an ocean that's been around for a long time. But its history has been predominantly in the context of a way of thinking about the world that I I'm also trying to warn people about. <laughs> Most people, when they talk about social construction, they're coming at it from something like a post-structuralist perspective or a uh, post-modern perspective, something like that. And uh, I'm not, I can't get into you know, other chapters in my text where I rant and reel about that, but I, I'm concerned about that. And so I'm very cautious in, in picking Searle, who I don't actually agree with, Particularly politically, he's a libertarian. <laughs> um, but I, I, uh, I just like the fact that his approach is a naturalist approach. And as uh, Dean DeVerne mentioned, or Dean DeVerne, um, you know, I, my book is an exercise in methodological naturalism. I, I like that approach to thinking about these problems because it provides an avenue to describe what's happening without having to worry about normative concerns. So there's, there's a reason there, but I can't get into the details. Your last question about where this is going. Uh, this is all supposed to be laying the groundwork for a second work, which is, I hope, um, more interesting. <laughs> it's, um, this is a two-part project. The first part I'm hopefully wrapping up now. But this is just trying to describe what's going on. Just trying to describe what's going on. And then I do want to get into a second project, which is what to do with this then. What, what are the strategies to respond to this? And there, there's a bit more that has to go into this, because I think that behind the scenes, it seems plausible to me that it's not really about liberal principles and the liberal framework. It's really about uh, a way of exploiting the natural world. That that's really what's behind all this. It, you know, the judges themselves may think that this is the right way to approach problems. 
But liberalism has been you know, the handmaiden of the capitalist enterprise. It seems pretty clear for a long time. And so that's what's really driving things. So I have to get into that. I have to get into a lot of other matters. But I have a second project. If I can uh, get around to doing it, we'll see. This one took four years. See. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Gordon. I'm going to close the question period and, and uh, let you off the hook. That was a tremendously engaging, sophisticated, um, intellectually nuanced, and uh, creative and agile presentation. And I'm sure that I speak for all of us when I say um, we can't possibly imagine that the second project could be more interesting because there's just a tremendous, tremendous amount to think about here. So please join with me, everyone, in thanking Gordon for this wonderful talk. Thank you. And the, the second part of our evening is an opportunity to continue the conversation over food and drink, which I do believe is happening on the fourth floor in the Terrace Lounge, if it's not just behind this door. Oh, gosh, I'm wrong. This time it's just behind this door. I really need to be better informed about what's going to happen. And I hope this also means that our door has been repaired. That was supposed to happen across the year-end break. But anyway... Whether we can proceed directly through here or whether we are going to go out and around, um, please uh, join me in moving one way or another. <laughs> <laughs>